what are your thoughts on modern day abortion being an unwitting or willful sacrifice to Moloch? Would a miscarriage, stillborn, aborted baby go to heaven, having not been physically born into the world? To ask another way, is the soul spirit imparted to the body at conception or upon physical birth? And does the Bible address the idea of a grace period for young children and their need for salvation in order to enter heaven? Would their fate fall upon the belief of their father or mother, or are they just out of luck? Is there any biblical merit to the idea of an age of innocence for children? Well, you know, let's take the uh, the first part about abortion being uh, an unwitting or, you know, versus a willful sacrifice to Moloch. I don't think there's, I mean, there, there might be somebody out there who goes in for an abortion thinking that, oh, this is my offering to Moloch, you know, or, or, or to a god. I basically don't think that's going to be the case, but you know, I'm not omniscient, so maybe there's somebody out there that thinks that. Do I think that there's a, a sinister, you know, evil supernatural mind somehow at some place, at some point or stage, propelling the abortion narrative? Yeah, I do. I, I do think that there's a, a supernatural evil element involved in this. When I say that, what I mean are things like, you know, the people just being taught today that the contents of a woman's womb is not human. You know, and and that's sort of this this trigger point of justifying you know abortion, even beyond you know this whole notion that it's my body. You know, the woman saying it's my body when it's actually not. I mean, if we if we're talking science here, okay, let's let's try to you know do some science here. The contents of the womb are genetically distinct from the woman, so therefore it is not her body. She's the host, but it's not her body that's being destroyed. It's someone else's body. Genetically, the contents of the womb are human. That's all that it ever can and will be. It won't transform into something else genetically. It is human, and it's alive. If you put the contents of a woman's womb on a Mars rock, you'd say you had discovered Martian life and won a Nobel Prize. It's living. It grows. Okay, It, it is becoming what it was intended to be. It's not the same as swabbing your cheek you know, to get human cells there because they will die. They won't grow into anything else. So it's different than that. Again, these are all scientific statements that are all very straightforward, very provable, very well known. But nevertheless, people are taught the opposite. So I think that whole effort, again, to get people to dehumanize humanity is something that, that's very sinister and evil. And I think supernatural evil does have a role to play in that whole process. I don't think that's a stretch at all. Now, the whole thing about the eternal destiny of the stillborn, the miscarried, the aborted baby, and and we can add as well, you know, babies that are born with with severe mental uh, incapacitation, uh, that they'll never actually be able to believe, you know, that that sort of thing. I put them all in in one category. The the best answer to this is go up to the Naked Bible blog. I I did an extensive series of posts on Romans 5.12. And one of them, and we'll provide the link to this on on this episode's page, one of them uh, dealt specifically with the fate of the unborn uh, infants and other human beings who cannot believe. Now, I'm not going to go through that whole thing, the the, the whole series on Romans 5.12, but I'll I'll basically give you the highlights. Romans 5.12 says, Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man and death through sin— And so death spread to all men because all sinned or all sin, you know, some translations will have. There you go. Well, this verse has been taken for not centuries, but millennia in the history of the Christian church. And this goes back to the church fathers. So I'm going to lay this at their feet. Uh, This verse is used to teach the idea that all, every human being after Adam inherited Adam's guilt. This is the the typical articulation of the doctrine of original sin. The doctrine of original sin has become sort of transformed into the doctrine of the transmission of Adam's guilt to all people. Okay, The verse never says that Adam's sin, the guilt, was transferred to other human beings. It never says that. Let me read it again. Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, okay, we know who that one man is, it's, it's Adam, okay, his sin, 
and death through sin. So when there was sin, then we have, you know, now, now death is part of the picture. And I would say it's human death because the rest of the verse is about humans, not animals or microbes. Okay. Therefore, or so death spread to all men. Did you catch that? Death is what spread to all men, all humans. Not guilt. Death. The text says death. Romans 5.12 is about the transmission of mortality to all humans. Because once Adam and Eve sin, they're driven from the garden, they're, they're cut off from the source of life, the presence of God, Eden, all that stuff. Again, they are now going to die. Okay, that, That's what God told them. It's about death. It's not about the transmission of guilt, moral guilt before God. Now, that makes a huge difference because, you know, if you believe that every human being inherits guilt because of Adam, well, then a baby that gets aborted that, you know, isn't in the body of Christ or is, is cut off from Christ, from believing in Christ, either because of death or, again, their mental incapacitation, they're going to go to hell. Now, you know, pastors, you know, people who are sensitive to this will will invent pastoral responses, you know, to to not say that. They'll say, oh, well, God makes an exception. Well, there's no verse for that. God loves cute babies, so therefore they're in heaven. You know, it, it, it's, it's bluster. It, it's contrived. It's made up. Or they'll say, well, God will make sure that, that you don't remember, you know, the, the, the death of your stillborn child, and, and, and you won't remember that it's in hell now. Well, again, there's no verse for that, but there are lots of verses that talk about or, or, or are evidence for the fact that we will remember you know, our lives and relationships here in this life, in the next life. Again, these are contrived answers because people are trapped by a, a flawed view of Romans 5.12. I've also talked on the blog about how this really impacts Jesus. Jesus is a descendant of Adam. He is the son of Adam. He's the son of David. You know, who they, he's human. So where does Jesus get off? in not inheriting Adam's guilt. And everybody, oh, the virgin birth, the virgin birth. Well, I got news for you. Mary was human. Okay. She was a descendant from Adam too. Where is the verse that says the sin nature or Adamic guilt flows through? Okay. Only men. There is no such verse. These are theological inventions. Okay. It, it also doesn't work to say, well, you know, Jesus, you know, was just kind of put into the womb by God, plopped in there. Well, that's nice. Then Paul gets to be wrong in Romans 1, 3, where he says that Christ is descended from David according to the flesh. Okay, Jesus is either human, a descendant of Adam, or he's not. Either the genealogies are correct, or they're not, or they're lies. Okay, they're not lies. They are real. They mean something. But if you're going to take the traditional view of Romans 5.12, Jesus inherited Adam's guilt. Now, the Catholic Church saw this problem very clearly, and so this is why they invented the doctrine that Mary was sinless. There's no verse that says that, but that gets Mary off the hook, and therefore it gets Jesus off the hook in that thinking, that, that theological approach. Again, these, these are contrivances because of the way the church fathers, specifically, you know, I guess Augustine, but he's, I mean, he's not the only one. But because of the way they influenced the history of the church to think about Romans 5.12, what I'm saying is look at the verse. It never refers to guilt at all. It's a mortality problem. Now, again, my view, and you can go read, read the, 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 I'd say read the whole series of posts because, you know, if, if I'm getting, if I'm going to get emails now, that, well, Mike, what about where it says that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God? And well, all those things are true. Okay, the biblical view is that guilt isn't transmitted to people by what someone else does, including Adam. Okay, we become guilty before God when we sin, and every human being is going to sin. There is no avoidance of sinning. Every human being will sin. The only exception to this was Jesus, because he also happened to be God. Okay, not, no other human being can say that. 
So all humans, if they're allowed to live, will sin against God and will become guilty before God. That's why every human being needs Christ. Now, again, if we think about this a little bit more, we have situations, you know, you have to define, okay, well, what, what is sin? You know, does it involve, you know, the, the act of the human will? You know, do you, do you, you know, have to knowingly rebel against God? I would say, yeah, you do. You know, and people would, would bring up sin language in the Old Testament, like in Leviticus. Hey, go listen to our Leviticus series on podcasts. The quote-unquote sins there are about moral, imp- you know, not moral impurity, but ritual impurity. It, it just, people get confused by the language of a, of a lot of Old Testament verses that really don't apply to moral transgressions at all. To have a moral transgression, you have to have an act of the will. And an infant that's two days old is not go, is not morally, willfully rebelling against the revelation of God in some area. It's just not doing that. So there there is, a, you know, a biblical theological argument to be made for innocence. Okay, uh, the aborted fetus never sinned. Again, the child that's one or two days old and, and then dies doesn't sin. You know the, the 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 child again who is severely you know uh, mentally incapacitated can't exercise you know a, a, the will to to rebel knowingly against God. I'm saying they're innocent. There is that category. Now they don't go to heaven because they're sinless or innocent, as though they're good enough. Okay, that is no one goes to heaven on the basis of any merit of their own at all period, zero. So what about the fate of of the unborn? Well, we have to ask ourselves, why do people go to hell? Why do they not have everlasting life? And the answer to that is, well, they've become guilty before God and nothing has, you know, they weren't able to participate in the means by which that they are forgiven and, 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 you know, joined to Christ. Okay. Well, why do people need Christ? Well, again, the answer is because they're guilty before God, and, and we know that Christ is the only way of salvation. Well, how do people, again, become guilty before God? The answer is we sin. Now, those who die, okay, those who die never having sinned, they're in a different category. Now, think with me here. Again, I'm just summarizing a, a very long series of posts here. Everyone at the last day will be raised, both the saved and the unsaved. And you read the end of the book of Revelation, other passages, this is, this is crystal clear. Everybody gets raised, some you know, to eternal life, some to damnation. Okay? Everybody gets raised. Well, of those that get, get raised, why do certain, again, experience damnation? They don't have everlasting life. The reason is because they were guilty before God. They've committed some offense against God, and that hasn't been taken care of, okay? We understand that clearly. But if that isn't the case, if you're raised at the last day and you are not guilty before God, by definition, using biblical language here, you do not suffer the second death, which is damnation. You are taken to be with the presence of God, not because you were good, not because you earned anything. You have eternal life because of Christ's resurrection. That is the only reason anyone is raised at all. Again, these are, I'm just throwing together a bunch of biblical statements here. It's because of the resurrection. So, you know, when I, I have met people, I have met people who have people in their family where a pastor told them, the child you lost in stillbirth is in hell, and it destroyed their faith. I think that's abominable. You know, I can honestly look somebody in the eye and say, look, your baby, you, you, you had an abortion, whatever you did, your baby is with the Lord, not because God makes exceptions, not because they're good enough, not because they're cute, not even because they never had the opportunity to sin. They are there because, yeah, they're not guilty before God, but they are raised with Christ like everyone else. It's just that when some are raised, you know, then they get, you know, revelation put in the lake of fire and others go to be with the Lord. The only reason anybody's going to wind up in the lake of fire is because their guilt has not been taken care of. Okay, the innocent don't have guilt. Therefore, by definition, 
they are raised with Christ to eternal life. Okay, that's what happens to them. That is, that's the fate of the unborn. So, yeah, there is this idea of innocence. We aren't given a number, and I don't think we can be given a number as far as the age. You know, you, you have to examine what, what does God view as rebellion against him that would incur guilt before him? Again, there, there's no silver bullet answer to that. All that I'm saying is that Romans 5.12, which is the reason the question even comes up, you know, that, that, that this whole idea of guilt being transmitted to every human being on the basis of Romans 5.12, that, that is the proof text for the doctrine. And then there are other verses, and look, don't, you're not, don't think you're going to surprise me with them in email. I know all of them. I've commented on all of them in this series on Romans 5.12, either in the posts or comments to the posts. I'm not missing something here. Okay, this is, this is something that, I, again, it sounds crazy, but I think the church has fundamentally misunderstood, and it really has some tragic consequences for people's life circumstances. And not only that, it gets you into real theological trouble with Jesus, you know, being a descendant of Adam. You know, other than those things, it's it's okay. You know, the traditional view is okay. Uh, you know, it's it's really it's not okay. It's a misunderstanding that that produces this this question. And what I'm saying is, you don't need to worry about Romans five twelve putting aborted babies in danger of damnation in hell. They are not guilty before God. The verse never says they are. Psalm 51, in sin, my mother can, you know, concede me. Well, yeah, we, we know that the act of intercourse isn't a sin, but how about we, we, we do the, just like we do in Genesis 1, the bet of predication. We'll have a grammar spasm here. How about we take the predicatory view of the preposition bet there? Okay, as sin or better, you could translate the same word in the, in the verse as a sinner my mother can see me. That's absolutely true. Every human being will sin. If they're, if they're allowed to live, they will sin. Invariably, inevitably, they will sin. So Psalm 51 is perfectly consistent with what I'm saying here. Again, I've, I've been down the road and back on all these verses. If I get emails, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to give you a link to the series on Romans 5.12. But it's an important issue. It's an important doctrine. These are important questions. So that's the quick version of how I would approach that. But to really, again, get a better articulation of it, read you know, the link that we'll provide. And I would, I would recommend reading the whole series.